Health, I'm Leslie Palma. Our top story tonight comes from Operation Rescue, where a Dirty Docs project is highlighting the sexual abuse many women suffer at the hands of abortionists. Sarah Neely, project coordinator for Operation Rescue, joins us to talk about her findings. Former President Donald Trump this week said he believes the states should have the responsibility of regulating abortion. I'll report on this in Political News in a Nutshell. The Arizona Supreme Court has upheld a law that will protect most babies from abortion in that state. That's the, that's the opener in tonight's Abortion in the News. The Washington Post on Sunday featured a story about a woman who tried several times to abort her baby. I'll tell you the unlikely but happy ending in our final segment. You won't want to miss it. Plus, I have a clarification on one of the stories reported last week on Pro-Life Primetime News. We said Republican doctors who serve in Congress were being targeted for their support for abortion. That was a mistake. An activist group is after them because they oppose abortion. Our apologies for the error and thanks to the viewer who was in, who was in touch to point it out. April is Sexual Abuse Awareness Month, and to highlight how rampant abuse is in the abortion industry, Operation Rescue launched Dirty Docs to report on the horrific sexual abuse countless women have suffered at the hands of abortionists. Sarah Neely is the project coordinator for Operation Rescue, and we've asked her to join us this evening to talk about what she uncovered as she researched Dirty Docs. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, thank you for having me. So Sarah, how did this project come about and how many abusers have you uncovered? Um, well, we had a meeting earlier in the year, kind of looking at the election year um, with Operation Rescue with our team. And um, we wanted to focus on talking points that put abortion advocates on the defense. You know, a lot of times we spend a lot of time defending our position, um, but there are a lot of things about the abortion industry that don't get highlighted, um, specifically, you know, an industry that is essentially hiding rapists and sexual abusers um, that do not see a lot of consequences. That does not get talked about a lot. And um, I've spoken with people who are abortion advocates. And when you point out some of these things um, and you ask them, one, they don't usually know and they don't usually have a great answer. Um, and so I think it's important to expose those parts of the abortion industry that are solid talking points for how abortion is hurting women, killing children, a bad industry. It's not a good industry at all. We all know that as pro-lifers. Um, so this campaign was really focused more on an audience of people that maybe uh, were okay with abortion or didn't really have an opinion. Um, it was focused. And so it wasn't really made for specifically pro-life people as much as it was for maybe some people that don't know a lot about the, the dirty underbelly of the abortion industry. Um, and when I started, I had about 20 names. And I think when I got done, well, I don't know that I'm ever done, but currently we have 40 um, that I've researched and I have a list of five more that have just, I, I just found one yesterday. I mean, I just keep finding more and more of abortionists who, who have been involved in some sort of sexual abuse. Wow. Well, let's talk about some of the worst abusers you found. Tell us about Jacob Callow in Michigan. So Jacob Callow is one, still licensed. That's the most important thing we need to know about Callow. Um, and he, his abuse started back in 1998. Um, a patient filed a police report um, basically Callow had given her, uh, when she came in, she got like two pills that she thinks were Valium and, um, he did a very, he did an improper breast exam on her. Um, but also when she laid down, um, he gave her a shot in the arm and, um, he said this really creepy thing where, where she said, well, I feel anything. And he said, no, you won't remember th anything either. Um, and so as the drugs took effect, she wasn't able to speak or move and she could feel him touching her inappropriately. Um, and she could feel him actually lick her in a spot that's very inappropriate. I won't get too graphic. Um, but, and then she blacked out. And so she woke up um, upset. She woke up scared. And they, the nurse and Kahlo were standing over her, telling her to breathe through this oxygen mask. And she just said she started crying. Um, so that was the first time. Well, in 2001, another patient came forward and filed a police report. These are all police reports. Filed a police report against Kahlo for doing something very similar, um, only she didn't black out. She was awake and she fought him off. She actually stumbled out of the room looking for her boyfriend um, when she felt him touching her inappropriately. She said, what are you doing? Um, and he said nothing. And so she got away. Um, and then 2014, another patient came forward, something very similar with inappropriate touching. 2016, um, another patient came forward. And like the patient in 1998, Callow said the same creepy thing to her. He said, you won't remember anything. And then gave her this shot in her arm. Two days later, she did remember. 
um, a lot of the issue. Remember to improper breast exam and some other improper touching. Um, and so just as recently as 2022, now this is four police reports. This man has never been disciplined by the medical board or the police. Um, and so um, another patient just came forward in 2022 and filed a police report where she explained that during a breast exam where she was made to take off all of her clothes from the waist up, um, Callow answered a FaceTime call during the exam while she was standing there, you know, exposed. Um, she also said in the report that she felt very uncomfortable several times, that he made her feel uncomfortable quite a few times during the whole um, exam. So he is, again, still licensed. Still Michigan, licensed. Something that happened in the 90s or in the 80s or whatever. This is recent. This man is out there and he's never been disciplined. Um, you know, it's it's hard to prove rape. Everybody knows that. Um, but no action has been taken. And I mean, these police reports are, are piling up. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So how about Ashitosh Vermani? What's his horror story? He's another one from North Carolina, and he is also still licensed. Um, he's had a lot. We focused on his sexual abuse. Um, if you look on our website, abortiondocs.org, you can look at some more of the infractions that he's been involved with. Um, but he was actually arrested in 2014. Um, he was charged with one count of second degree rape, two counts of second degree sexual offense. Um, but that case was dropped in 2015 for uh, insufficient evidence. And that happens a lot. What we see a lot with these cases are anytime a woman comes forward, a lot of times it gets thrown out for insufficient evidence. Um, there's one case where a girl was um, drugged and raped and it was thrown out because she was not considered a reliable witness because she was drugged and she was the only other person there. Um, that wasn't with Vermani, it was another doctor. But so in 1992, Vermani actually got in trouble for having an improper sexual relationship with a patient. And so in 2014, it is clear nothing had really changed. Um, but in 2021, he was suspended. His license was suspended for several different infractions. Um, but one of them was disrobing patients for no medical reason. And this is, this is kind of crazy. So in 2021, they interviewed staff members and they testified that they had seen Vermani lifting the gowns of patients. Like when they were laying on the table, he would reach up and lift the gowns above their chest to expose their breasts, which for no medical reason. And instead of reporting him, the nurses actually testified that they built what they called a tenting mechanism, like a tent, so that it was harder for uh, Vermani to see over. Instead of just reporting him, reporting they kind of like this, this strange approach of like building a tenting mechanism so their nasty doctor couldn't look at women. Um, so again, he's one that he has been disciplined for some things, but those disciplines are like a suspension. Maybe, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. there's no criminal, um, you know, like I said, in 2014, he got out of that due to a uh, lack of evidence and he's licensed in North Carolina and Florida right now practicing wow. with access to women. Wow. So the first abortionist I saw when I opened your website this week was Akiva Abraham, who actually went to a woman's home to assault her. Tell us about him. Yes. And that, again, this was not that long ago. This was uh, 2002 that this man, he had, it was a chemical abortion. He had given her the first dose of medication at his office. Um, and then five days later, he gave her the second dose. I believe it was at his office. Um, and then she had gone home. Well, later he showed up at her apartment or house um, and he had a little baggie of pain medication, pain medication that he never documented as a medicine that he administered to her. There was no documentation for this medicine. Um, and he gave her the medicine and waited until after she had taken it and ingested it. And then he proceeded to have sex with her. Um, and, and if you imagine, if you know anything about a chemical abortion, if she's taken the second regimen, you're talking about cramping bleeding. Yeah. You're not talking about, you know, I mean, this would be painful. And yeah. for him to just prey on her like that. And he actually, he actually could continue to have sex with this patient. He admitted later to having sex with this patient several more times, uh, many times in his office. And then the abuse came to light later. Um, and so if you read some of his stuff, I mean, he, a committee actually um, from the medical board they found him to have a personality disorder that they said had narcissistic and um, 
social, antisocial features is how they described it. Um, and so this man, he, in the same list of charges of him raping this woman at her home, he actually induced a woman into early labor just to accommodate his vacation plans. He didn't tell her that, obviously. Um, and he lied on his website. He actually had uh, posted he was a member of the American Medical Association. Um, he posted that he was a member of the American Association of Gynecological Laparoscopy, um, neither of which were true. Um, so just just a, a liar, you know, yeah. a liar and a rapist. And a rapist. And, you know, and, and, and he was licensed um, in New York for, I think, about seven years total that he had access to these women. Unbelievable. So beyond losing their licenses, which apparently many of them don't, do any of these monsters ever go to prison? A small, a small amount. Um, Thomas McAllis is one. He is serving 15 years for child porn is what he finally got caught for um, after several other incidents. Um, Brian Finkel's another one. He's serving 35 years for 22 counts of sexual abuse. I think he was originally charged with over 50. Um, 22 are the ones they could charge, and that was patients um, over, I want to say, a 17-year span. Um, there was one named Rodolfo Finkelstein, and he should be in prison. Um, he was actually looking at, at life in prison and for rape, and he fled the country. So he's okay. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, he did get caught in Argentina. I think he spent a year, one year in prison in Argentina, and then he was released. He was never expedited. Um, and then there was a, another one, Ronald Tauber, who he was sentenced to 50 years for raping a six-year-old girl, um, but he only did eight. And um, I don't, he did try to practice medicine again. He actually tried to practice medicine in New York. They gave him a probationary license, um, but he didn't follow the rules, shockingly. And so, um, you know, they, they, they revoked it. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, out of the 40, 45 that I've looked into, four of them have ever, and, and all the, a lot of the other ones, they may have done, like, you see a lot of like, maybe they got sentenced jail time, but you know, they marked it as time served and then they just had probation or, you know, they, they certainly don't get their medical licenses taken away and they continue to get medical licenses, even if they have broken the law or been convicted. Um, I mean, it's it's wild that these guys are, if there was any other medical profession that had this going on, I feel like everyone would know about it. Yeah, but, you. you know, abortionists, they're working in clinics. Women are coming to them who are going through a procedure they don't want someone to know about, probably most of them. Um, so they're not, they're not as uh, apt to come forward. And, you know, these predators take advantage of that. So do you have any idea why this is happening? Why there are so many present predators in the abortion industry? You know, I've heard I've heard many people say, other doctors say that, you know, abortionists are kind of the bottom of the barrel for a doctor. You know, they're not. And these guys, if you look, these guys aren't even good OBGYNs. I mean, you look at some of these, I only focused on the sexual abuse, but the way that some of these guys ruined labors, I mean, traumatized women, they're not good doctors. And they end up in this abortion industry that's poorly regulated, that is politically protected, and where they just have access to women that nobody wants to see again anyway. Okay. So, you know, it, to me, it's, it's the whole idea, you know, abortion runs on deception. And it's just another deception of the abortion industry is that it's put forward as this pristine, you know, great thing that's helping women empowers them. But it's not true. That's not what that's not what deficiency reports tell us. That's not what the police reports tell us. You know, that's not what the medical boards tell us. But they choose to not really discipline these guys. And I think part of it is that it's very difficult to get rid of anybody's medical license. It's really hard. They make it very difficult. Um, but, I, you know, some of these guys are for the, the entire for the rest of their career, they're required to have a female chaperone if they see a female patient female patient. And to me, if you're a doctor and you've gotten to a point where you're not allowed to see a patient without a chaperone, why are you licensed? Yeah, you know, their wrong. license should just be revoked. Yeah, I agree. Well, so all of these stories can be found at operationrescue.org. And we urge our viewers to visit the site throughout April to learn this pretty much untold story about the abortion industry. And Sarah, thank you for all the work you put into bringing this to the public's attention and for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me.
In an announcement heard around the world, former President Donald Trump used his Truth Social account on Monday to say he believes regulation of abortion should be left to individual states. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. The announcement was not welcomed by all pro-life groups, with Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, saying her organization is deeply disappointed in President Trump's position, and former Vice President Mike Pence calling the policy a slap in the face. But others in the pro-life camp welcomed the position, with Students for Life President Kristen Hawkins saying she was happy Trump had not embraced a federal law that would protect babies later in pregnancy, like a 15-week ban Trump had considered supporting prior to Monday's announcement. I'm pleased to see that President Trump listened to pro-lifers and isn't going to allow, allow a divisive late-term limit that some GOP insiders were pushing, Hawkins said, noting that nine out of every 10 abortions would remain legal with a 15-week law. Here at Priests for Life, National Director Frank Pavone embraced the pragmatism of Trump's position, saying the announcement calls to mind the drafting of the U.S. Constitution at a time when slavery was still legal. The founders understood they could not get the Constitution ratified if it contained an absolute anti-slavery position, Pavone said. They needed to get the nation started. But with the Constitution they did adopt, they put in place the very mechanism by which slavery was in fact ultimately abolished. President Trump is taking a similar stance. We have to save the nation by winning this election. Right now we have a nation divided on abortion, but by saving the nation itself from the destruction by the Democrats, we will preserve the very mechanism by which we can continue to build a culture of life. Trump pulled in more than $50 million at a fundraiser Saturday in Palm Beach, Florida. That's about double what Joe Biden raised in a single event that featured former presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. This is likely to be the biggest and one of the most successful fundraising events in political history, said GOP fundraiser Brian Ballard. Trump, joined by his wife Melania, spoke for 45 minutes to an audience of 120 Deep Pockets donors gathered at the home of billionaire hedge fund manager John Paulson. More than 50 leftist, leftist activist groups have thrown their support behind a bill that would impose term limits for Supreme Court justices. The Term Act, which has not seen any movement since being reintroduced in Congress last year, calls for 18-year term limits for Supreme Court justices and would allow each president two appointments. Once a justice retires, he or she would take senior status and fill in as a substitute when the court falls below nine justices due to recusals. The bill is not expected to advance in this congressional session. An effort is underway to bring Nebraska in line with the majority of the country in the way it allocates its electoral votes in a presidential election. Electoral votes are winner-take-all in the 48 states, meaning the candidate who wins the popular vote receives all of the state's electoral votes. But Maine and Nebraska use the congressional district method, which allocates two electoral votes to the state popular vote winner and one electoral vote to the popular vote winner in each congressional district. There are three congressional districts in Nebraska, and one of them, which encompasses Omaha, ordinarily votes for the Democrat in the otherwise bright red state. That happened in 2008 when Barack Obama won the second district, gaining a Democratic electoral vote in the state for the first time since 1964. It happened again in 2020 when Biden picked up an electoral vote in the district. Governor Jim Pillen supports the change, but time is running out, with the legislative session just days away from its conclusion. The conservative group Turning Point USA was in Omaha Tuesday, urging the governor to call a special session to get the job done. And that's political news in a nutshell. The Arizona Supreme Court on Tuesday upheld a law protecting most babies from abortion, clearing the way for the state to become the 15th in the nation to offer those protection. The law that has exceptions for medical emergencies was originally passed in 1864, but enforcement was blocked by the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. The Dobbs ruling in 2022 led to the law being briefly enacted, but it was put on hold when the nation's number one abortion seller challenged it. Abortionists who violate the law can be punished with prison sentences from two to five years, but the state's pro-abortion attorney general has vowed not to prosecute abortionists who break the law. No woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this law as long as I'm attorney general, Chris Mays said after the ruling, not by me nor by any county attorney serving in our state, not on my watch. The state's pro-abortion governor, Katie Hobbs, last year issued an executive order that gave all power to enforce abortion laws to the attorney general, 
and on Tuesday she called on the state legislature to repeal the law. Some Republicans in the state, including Carrie Lake, who is running for the U.S. Senate, have said the law goes too far. Lake called on the governor and legislature to craft a new law that all Arizonans can support. In Indiana, the group Hoosier Jews for Choice and five anonymous state residents have won the right to have an abortion because they do not believe life begins at conception. The American Civil Liberties Union sued the, stu the state on behalf of the group, arguing that the state's Religious Freedom Restoration Act grants them the right to abort children who they believe are somehow growing, developing, and moving in the womb without being alive. A county judge sided with the group in 2022, and last week the Indiana Court of Appeals agreed with that decision. The Indiana Supreme Court could be the next step. The right to abortion does not extend to anyone who is not included in the lawsuit. Thanks to a state law that protects babies from abortion with only a few exceptions, abortions in Indiana dropped to just 46 in the last three months of 2023. More than 50 pro-life groups are urging the House Judiciary Committee and pro-life chairman Jim Jordan to hold a thorough hearing regarding five babies who died in late-term abortions in a D.C. killing center. The babies were among 115 abortion victims whose bodies were given to abortion activists outside the Washington Surgery Clinic in March 2022. Although the activists who found them asked the police to investigate, and despite repeated requests from members of Congress and the public, to date no autopsies or investigations have taken place. Several pro-life physicians believe some of the babies may have been killed by the illegal partial birth abortion procedure or were born alive and allowed to die. And finally, a woman who refused abortion after being diagnosed with breast cancer in 2020 and then chronicled her health journey on Instagram has died. Jessica Hanna, a mother of four, including the three and a half year old she did not abort, died on Saturday night surrounded by family. She suffered joyfully and without fear in her last days, her husband posted on Jessica's Instagram account, blessed by cancer. After undergoing chemotherapy while pregnant and praying for the intercession of St. Gianna Beretta Mala, Jessica was elated when her cancer went into remission, but it returned in December 2022. With death comes resurrection, Christ made it so, Jessica posted on Good Friday, one of her last messages, be joyful in your sufferings. And that's abortion in the news. Tonight I would like to highlight something rare, a beautiful story with a pro-life happy ending reported in the ordinarily abortion-friendly Washington Post. A young woman from San Antonio was the subject of the story in Sunday's editions. Identifying the woman only by her first name, Evelyn, reporter Amber Ferguson told readers how a brief relationship in early 2022 led to a pregnancy that Evelyn spent the next eight and a half months trying to abort, all while hiding her growing baby bump from the parents who had adopted her as a baby. Evelyn went to an abortion business in San Antonio but was turned away because the heartbeat law was in effect by then and her daughter's heart was already beating. She went to Oklahoma and with the help of her own birth mother, obtained the drugs for a chemical abortion, but discovered more than two months later that the abortion had not killed her baby. This discovery came after the Dobbs decision in the U.S. Supreme Court had already overturned Roe v. Wade, and states including Texas and Oklahoma had begun enacting laws to protect babies from abortion. Evelyn next went online and found a website that for $150 would mail her abortion pills from India. She took the pills, but again remained pregnant. The online abortionist offered to send her more medication, but by this time she was five months pregnant and too late for a third chemical abortion. Evelyn was in her third trimester when she found Southwestern Women's Options in Albuquerque, a late-term abortion seller that we know has performed abortions up to at least 32 weeks. Staffers there connected her to an abortion fund that would cover the cost of her plane tickets and hotel and pay the $12,000 she would need for the abortion. But at Southwestern, they determined she was 32 weeks pregnant and, surprisingly, declined to do the abortion. Evelyn went home and told her parents she was pregnant. Her baby was born November 10, 2022. She quickly discovered she was in love, the reporter wrote. She took selfie videos with playful social media filters holding her daughter. Her photo album quickly filled with videos of Evelyn bottle feeding, learning to swaddle and admiring the baby's fussy sounds. Days later, a 44-year-old single woman who had frozen some of her eggs but was unable to find a suitable sperm donor, and then was turned down by several adoption agencies because she was too old and unmarried, got a call from a Fort Worth adoption agency about a baby who had just been born and whose mom was looking for an adoptive mother. We'll let a video that accompanies the Post article tell the rest of the story. No tears no today. Tears. No tears today. You got it, Bubba. You got it. We were kind of processing to call with Evelyn and her family. And I told my sister, I said, I hope she chooses me. If she doesn't, it's okay. 
Um, I'll be matched with another family. I believe that everything works out for a reason. And literally one minute later, um, my caseworker called and said, Evelyn would like to choose you as the adoptive mom. And so I just started crying and I felt like I won the lottery when I got the call that I was chosen. Tell me what happened. It was exciting, but then it also felt uh, reaffirming and that I knew that this was a path I was supposed to walk. The day of placement, we were all together in the room and then eventually the caseworkers cleared out and said, let's give Car Carolyn and Evelyn some time for them to just connect the two of them. So that was when I asked her just, you know, about her life, the, the birth father, and I didn't want to be intrusive, but she was very open. I don't know if I'm nervous, but excited definitely. And I know I'm going to cry. So seeing the pictures and videos of her growing up over the months, it's exciting to look at, but now I get to see her in person and hold her and touch her and hug her. So that really means a lot to me. Underneath the, underneath the couch. <laughs> hey. Thank you very much. Hey. hey. There you go. Yep. You gonna stand up? You know, a child is supposed to be surrounded by love no matter the lineage. And so what's beautiful about this is that because we did an open adoption, Olivia is gonna be surrounded by so much love. My family, Evelyn's family, Evelyn. Happy girl. Look at that happy girl. Aww. Her dimple is so cute. <laughs> oh, girl. Oh, this is smile. Thank you so much for joining us on Pro Life Primetime News, produced at Priest for Life headquarters in Titusville, Florida. If you like this show, please consider making a donation to ProLifeGift.org. These donations help fund all of our work here at Priest for Life, which enables us to continue educating, equipping, and activating God's people to end abortion. For all your Pro Life News updates during the week, please follow us on X at Pro Life News Show. I'm Leslie Palma, Communications Director. Remember, life is the only choice.